Reparation is a fundamental obligation of Christianity. Why did Christ come upon the earth to make reparation for no other reason? He came to repair his divine work which sin had ruined, to restore to man his supernatural life, to compensate by his merits for the insult offered to the Father in the Garden of Eden and for those insults which man's malice daily renews and multiplies. He came to expiate by his sufferings in the stable, during his hidden life, and on the cross, the human selfishness which began with man's creation and never ceases. Our dear Lord could have performed this work of reparation alone, but he did not so will it. He has chosen as associates each one of us, every Christian. We must grasp this truth well, for it is the foundation of the doctrine of reparation. St. Paul when speaking to the early Christians of their preeminent dignity of sharing the very life of the Son of God, tells them that as Jesus lives by the Father, so they live by Jesus. He shares that life in virtue of his divine nature, they in virtue of their adoption. He is their head, they are the living members, who, in virtue of his sacrifice, possess a divine life. They are divinely naturalized, Union is only perfect when the members are united to the head and the head to the members. The person of Christ is the head. They are his members, his mystical body. Hence, according to the teaching of our Lord, I am the vine, you are the branches, and that of St. Paul, the Catholic Church teaches that the personal Christ, consisting of the union of his divine and human nature, such as, of old, he lived in Bethlehem, Nazareth and Jerusalem, such as he now lives in the Holy Eucharist, such as he lives and will live in heaven until the end of time, does not constitute the whole Christ. He has willed it thus. The whole Christ consists of himself the head, plus ourselves, his mystical body. Our intimate union with his life explains why our Lord has associated us so closely with his work of redemption. Yet, as we have said, our Savior could have perfectly accomplished it alone. He does not need us to add to his merits, but he wills to make use of us, that he may increase ours. He is the Christ. We Christians are each of us alter Christus, another Christ. We must work together. The redemption will only be brought about by the will of our Savior, the first Christ, and of all Christians, those other Christs. Undoubtedly, his participation and ours differ immeasurably. His has an intrinsic, infinite value and is, of itself, infinitely sufficient. God could have dispensed with our cooperation, but because he loves us, he asks for it. At the offertory of the Holy Mass, the priest first puts wine in the chalice. Then, under pain of mortal sin, he has to add a few drops of water. Thus our Lord's role and ours are symbolized, together with the proportional value of his actions and ours. The wine alone would suffice for the validity of the consecration. Nevertheless, the drops of water must be added, and by the effect of the divine words of consecration, they are changed, as well as the wine, into the precious blood. Granted, our part in the redemption of the world is infinitesimally small, What are a few drops of water? But God requires it, and he transubstantiates this teeny addition by uniting it by his own offering. This mere nothing becomes all-powerful in virtue of the power communicated to it by God. Every comparison requires some modification. The few drops of water are not required for the validity of the sacrament, but for its licitness. Nothing so intrinsically insignificant and yet so really precious on account of our own union with Christ, many souls would probably be lost. The world needs all of its potential saviors. It needs Jesus, its chief savior, its savior par excellence. It needs each one of us who are called to cooperate with him in the redemption of the world. Thanks to this nothing, which has become something, souls will be ransomed. Without the offering of this, We are almost ignorant of our greatness as Christians. If we do not know our obligation of sharing in the work of redemption, if we try to shirk our part, we are omitting a most noble duty. 
How did Christ make reparation? But we must examine this matter more closely. How did Christ make reparation? By suffering. Here a problem confronts us. The Son of God, desiring to renew His work, to restore all to its primitive condition, was not obliged to choose a plan of redemption which would involve for Himself a life of suffering, pain, and humiliation. Yet it was precisely this plan that he chose, rejecting all others, because he willed to repair it all by suffering. Whence it follows that, as we are necessarily united with Christ in his mission, since we form his mystical body, so we must necessarily cooperate with him in his sufferings or passion. Therefore, St. Paul, when explaining the necessity of our cooperating with Jesus in his work of redemption, goes straight to the point and tells us that we must fill up those things that are wanting, not in the mission of Christ, but in his passion. The two unite, neither can exist alone. We must make reparation with Christ, and we can only do this by uniting our sacrifice with his. Bousset writes, In order to become the Savior of men, Jesus Christ willed to be a victim, but since he has a mystical body, it follows that if the head is immolated, all the members likewise must become living victims. Here is the progression we might more correctly say, the equation be a Christian, a savior, a victim. Nor is the term victim something strange or new. This doctrine is as old as the gospel. It is the very foundation of the preaching of St. Paul, of the early fathers of the church in all ages. The apostle, in his epistle to the Romans, sets forth this doctrine very clearly. He writes, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto God. We cannot be true Christians and at the same time strive to lead a comfortable life, hoping at its close to pass quietly, without any shock, from a world in which we are very well off, to a heaven where we shall be perfectly happy, a heaven that is to be the reward of a life which practically our chief anxiety has been to leave to others the laborious task of cooperating with Christ in redeeming the world. No. Indeed, such a program is incompatible with the gospel of our Divine Master. His program is totally different. It consists in the terrible seriousness of our human life. Yes, Deep abysses surround us, that of man's sin, that of God's love. God has placed the latter closer to the former, and we stand between the two with our role clearly and imperatively defined. It is characteristic of the true disciple of Jesus Christ that he has found out these abysses and, in consequence, lives in an irrepressible anxiety for the salvation of the world, both on account of the sterility of the precious blood and of his share of the responsibility in the story of the divine life upon earth. All Christians are under two obligations. First, they must make reparation in union with Jesus Christ, who came upon earth solely for this purpose, and with whom they form one unit. Secondly, they must make this reparation as he wills it, namely, by suffering. Too few of the faithful have the faintest conception of the Christian life, they seem to imagine that practically there are two doctrines taught by our Lord, or at least two ways of interpreting his one law, one consisting in trying to suffer, the other in striving not to suffer at all, one of deliberate mortification, the other of deliberate avoidance of whatever is irksome. Briefly stated, they believe in an easy-going, comfortable kind of Christianity destined for the majority of Christians, whereas the other kind of Christianity austere and crucifying, is reserved for those stern characters or fantastical people who feel drawn to it. As the Curie de Ars, a saint, should write as follows, Everything reminds us of the cross. We ourselves are made in the form of a cross. Balm and sweetness exhale from the cross. The unction, which overflows from the cross, inundates our souls in proportion as we unite ourselves with it holding it tightly against our hearts. The cross contains more wisdom than any book. All who do not know this book are ignorant, however many other books they have studied. 
Those only are truly wise who love and consult this book, who study it deeply. Bitter as this book is, they are never happier than when they can immerse themselves in its bitterness. The more they frequent this school, the more they desire to remain there. Never do their studies weary them. End quote. In a novitiate of the Franciscans of Mary in Canada, on one occasion six religious were wanted to go to China to take care of some lepers. There were forty novices, and all the forty volunteered, each eager to have that honor. Some Christians, hearing this, remark coldly, It is their vocation. The very examples which should arouse these lax souls and convince them that they are bound to do something, if not as much as these nuns, only serve as specious pretexts for justifying their inaction. They argue thus, Monks and nuns remain in prayer all night, prostrate before the altar, or rise for prayer at two in the morning in order that we may sleep uncomfortably in a good bed. They pass their time in prayer in order to dispense us from the exceedingly disagreeable task. They deprive themselves of food, therefore we can allow ourselves every luxury. They live in whitewashed cells, furnished only, like those of Carmelites, with a crucifix, a holy water stoop, a death's head, and a discipline, so that we may adorn our houses with numerous ornaments and every modern comfort. If these religious go without fires, it is to allow us to have an excellent system of heating and a pleasant temperature in our rooms and passages. They sleep on a plank or a straw mattress, that we may have silken edder down coverlets and embroidered counterpanes. Their only jewelry is the cross, therefore we can wear trinkets and pearl necklaces that cost a fortune. Undoubtedly, the perfect life exacts an amount of suffering for which an ordinary Christian life does not call. But we can imagine any truly enlightened Christian life, even an ordinary one, that in any way harmonizes with the feverish and pagan pursuit of the comforts of life which modern materialism tries and unhappily, too often with success, impose upon so many of Christ's disciples. What then is Christ, perchance, divided? Are there two Christs? Is there a crucified Christ, whom we can only serve by our crucifixion, and a restful Christ, whom we can manage to follow quite well, while partaking of all of life's joys and pleasures? St. Paul did not preach two Christs. He knew of only one, Christ crucified. Men have changed this since St. Paul's time. Now they know two. The first, the true Christ, did not suffice, so they invented another, one without a cross, or a crucifying doctrine, a Christ without those two beams which cast such a disquieting, impressive shadow, a Christ who demands amounts to this, live as you please, I promise you a happy eternity, provided that you turn to me at your last moment with your darkening mind, that you repent with your failing will, and give me the alms of your last breath. There is no such Christ as this for Christians who will not suffer. The disciple is not greater than his master. Our Savior has suffered, and every Christian must suffer in some form or other, as we shall explain, if he would not prove false to his name, or fail to accomplish his mission. He must always and necessarily be the friend of suffering. A great Belgian statesman took for his motto, Rest Elsewhere. The day of perfect happiness, perhaps not far off, will surely dawn, perhaps soon, and will have no sunset. Meanwhile, time is given us that we may merit the joy of the Lord. But we can only enter into the joy of the Lord on the condition that upon earth we have shared the sufferings of our Lord. Christ was the first to choose suffering as the way into glory. Golgotha is not a rhetorical flourish. For us, too, the same rule holds. We wish to triumph with him, therefore we must wish to fight with him. Let all who are afraid remain where they are. Let the others cross over and follow me. This is stern language, and in spite of the convincing force of the doctrine, many draw back rather than face the suffering, which is the inevitable consecration of all Christian life. Our Lord wishes us to make reparation. 
The necessity for our making reparation is logically deduced from the very foundation of our Catholic faith and, in particular, from the doctrine of the mystical body of Christ and that of the redemption. It is likewise shown to be an imperative duty from the long, formal, and constantly reiterated chain of instruction given by our blessed Lord. Whether we open the Gospels or examine the great revelations handed down to us, we constantly see our Lord setting forth His great desire to find souls capable of suffering, utilizing it for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. Let us turn first to the Gospel. There are numerous texts which teach the obligation of doing penance as an act of reparation. No law is more frequently inculcated. Our Master chose St. John the Baptist as his precursor. What did he preach? The baptism of penance for the remission of sins. St. Luke chapter 3 verse 3. What does he continually repeat day after day on the banks of the Jordan where Jesus himself was soon to commence his ministry? Do penance, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. St. Matthew chapter 3 verse 3. How does he live? As an example, John had his garment of camel's hair. His meat was locusts and wild honey. His abode, the desert of Judea. How does he answer those who came to him asking, Who art thou? I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Men had made God's path crooked. It had to be made straight again. This is reparation. What a well-merited rebuke he gave to those hypocrites who came to ask for the baptism of penance without any intention or desire to lead a better life. Ye brood of vipers, bring forth fruit worthy of penance. The axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every time that doth not yield good fruit shall be cut down and cast into the fire. Hasten, for there cometh one, he is even now among you, and you know him not. If he finds good wheat, he will gather it into his barns, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Is it possible to set forth, in a clear or more thrilling manner, the necessity of suffering as an act of expiation, the obligation of returning to the straight path, of atoning for past faults, of imploring pardon by offering some proportionate penance? Afterwards our blessed Lord himself appeared in public. He commenced his ministry by fasting in the desert for forty days. When he called men to be his apostles, he bade them leave all and follow him, and exhorted the crowds that surrounded him to deny themselves. St. Matthew significantly remarks, From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Do penance, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. St. Matthew seems to point out that from the very beginning of Jesus' public life, he preached on the themes so dear to him and so constantly reiterated in his discourses. Moreover, our Lord extolled suffering and expiation for her sin all his life. He taught men to give one coat to the poor if they had two, not to trouble about what they should wear, that money was to be despised and heavenly treasure alone valued. He constantly anathematized those who loved the broad road and ever strove to lead men to walk in the narrow way. He predicted untold woes to the rich and to hypocrites. He taught men that the truly blessed are those who are poor and gentle, those who weep, those who thirst for justice, who are merciful, pure in heart, those who are peacemakers and who suffer persecution. Such is his doctrine. Are you willing, he asks, to follow me seriously? Then as a preliminary step you must deny yourselves and embrace the cross with both hands. Nothing less will avail. Our Lord does not restrict his teaching to words. Had God merely given maxims or precepts, he would have not been understood. He reduced his words to actions. The word was made flesh. That which had hitherto reached only to the ear became visible to the eye. Precept became example. Jesus lived his whole life upon the earth as a victim, that he might give us an example and teach us how to suffer. 
As soon as he came into this world, how did he explain his life's work? He saith, The victims of the past thou wouldest not. Then said I, Behold, I come. In the womb of Mary, Jesus only began his apprenticeship for the victim's life. He was to lead later in the confinement of innumerable tabernacles. Jesus was born, and in the manger, in the stable, in Bethlehem, he was still a victim. As Tertullian writes, he was a victim from the virgin birth. From his birth onward, his sufferings continued. He endured the circumcision, the flight into Egypt, the exile, there nothing was lacking as regards to suffering. Hence in his public life Jesus could say, Blessed are those that suffer, blessed are the poor. How these words would have provoked resentment had he been born in luxury. But he was the most destitute and afflicted of all. In Nazareth he lived a hidden life. Had he not done so, men would have never accepted the doctrine of humility which he preached afterwards. As it is, in spite of his example, how few trouble about his doctrine. Men love to be seen. He effaced himself during thirty years. A ransom was required to atone for men's pride, so Jesus lived a hidden, obscure life of painful toil. During his public life, Jesus wearied and footsore, tramped the roads of Palestine in search for souls. He was thirsty and asked the woman of Samaria for a drink. He spent nights in prayer. Unceasingly he exercised his ministry. Foxes have their holes, birds their nests, but the Son of Man had not where to lay his head, not a roof to shelter him. He had to make reparation for all those who pursue vain things and worship the golden calf, for the children of God who either forget or deliberately neglect to pray to him, for the sowers of evil seeds, and for those in whom the good remain sterile. When Jesus began his ministry, what name did the Baptist give him? The Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. John meant, he is the silent victim for all men who will save the world. Throughout three years, Jesus with divine patience endeavored to impress upon his apostles that the Christ must be delivered up to his enemies. They could not understand his words. Their meaning only dawned upon them when, from their hiding place in Jerusalem, they saw him afar off, nailed to the cross on the summit of Calvary. But above all, Jesus stands forth as a victim in his passion. Then, because he so willed, he was betrayed, denied, insulted, buffeted, outraged, and nailed to the cross. Thus he willed to teach us to suffer in our body, our affections, our reputation, and our honor. He suffered likewise, because divine justice required some compensation for all those who only live for pleasure who betray their baptismal vows and their faith. For those who deny the faith, who mock at the passion and persecute Christ's disciples, for those who scoff at the church, the pope and priests in a word, for all who, in their shameless egoism, find the cross of Christ so irksome. Christ so much loved reparation that he glorified it in Mary Magdalene, once publicly known as a sinner, who became... Mary of Bethina, where he called her to himself, a model of repentance and love, and afterwards Mary of Golgotha. At the foot of the cross there were but three, you will never find many where there is suffering to endure, three only, one man and two women, Mary, John, and the Magdalene, between two who had never lost their innocence, one with innocence regained at the price of generous expiation through a twofold breakage, her broken vase and her broken heart. Mystical Revelations and Reparation We have seen how greatly our Lord values reparation. Leaving the Gospel, let us now turn to the great revelations handed down to us in the history of the Church. In the revelations made to St. Margaret Mary, our Lord's one object appears to have been to ask for her reparatory sacrifices. Let us take a few examples from her life. On one occasion, Jesus said to her, Behold the heart which has so loved men, and in return only receives ingratitude and contempt. 
That is why I ask thee to make reparation. End quote. The saint tells us, quote, The sacred heart wills that soul should make reparation by returning him love for love, and that they should humbly implore pardon of God for all the insults that are offered to him. End quote. Again, Jesus said to her, quote, My daughter, it is true that my heart has sacrificed everything for men, without receiving from them any return. I feel this more acutely than the torments of my passion. In spite of all my eagerness to do them good, they treat me with coldness and contempt. Give me the pleasure of making up for their ingratitude. In 1669, in the month of February, at the time of the carnival, St. Margaret Mary wrote, quote, The loving heart of Jesus seems to make me this request, namely, that I would stay with him, close to his cross, in these days during which all rush madly after pleasure, and that by the bitterness which he will make me taste, I should, in some measure, compensate for the bitterness with which sinners immolate his sacred heart. He wishes me to grieve unceasingly with him, to prevent sinners from filling up the measure of their guilt. In order that reparation might be made by devout souls, our Lord asked for a special feast to be instituted in honor of his sacred heart, for the communion of reparation for the first Friday of each month, and at other times for this same object, and for the practice of the holy hour. Most of Christ's instructions to Margaret Mary tended to train her and through her ourselves in a spirit of reparation. This is what he asked of her for the holy hour. Every week, from the Thursday night to the Friday morning, I will cause thee to share in the deadly sadness which I allowed to overwhelm my soul in the Garden of Olives. Thou wilt rise between eleven o'clock and midnight, and remain prostrate, flat upon the ground for one hour, that thou mayest satisfy the divine justice, by employing mercy for sinners and likewise. In some measure, Mitigate sadness I felt when my apostles abandoned me and could not watch even one hour with me. End quote. It is impossible to misunderstand our Lord's meaning. The first time the Sacred Heart appeared to this saint on December 27, 1673, he was seen upon the altar, the chosen place of sacrifice, with the face of one in pain. He asked her to draw a picture of his Sacred Heart with the wound made by the lance, surrounded by a crown of thorns, and surmounted by a cross. Hence we can well understand the fiery utterances of St. Margaret Mary. She exclaims, quote, If you only knew how our Sovereign urges me to love him with a love that will share his life of suffering, I know of nothing that is more fitted to ease the tiresomeness of our lives than patient endurance with love. Let us suffer lovingly, without complaining, and count as lost all moments past without suffering. End quote. The whole life of this saint is one hymn of reparation, of love that begets conformity to his suffering life. It is useless to give copious citations from her life or works. They must be read through. The Reverend Pierre Terrien, in his well-grounded book on devotion to the Sacred Heart, says, to make reparation is to love, but above all to suffer, to sacrifice self through love. It is in the heart of Jesus that we obtain the precious supplement of love, which alone can render our reparations really pleasing to him. End quote. Jesus knocks at the door of our heart, asking us to make reparation, but our poor alms have no value unless they pass through his heart. There is a blessed ebb and flow of the tide of love. It originates with him and invites us, and our love must return to that center if we are to correspond effectually with his advances. This love does not, however, take away our instinctive horror of pain. Thus we find our Lord saying to St. Teresa, quote, My daughter, thou askest me for suffering, and then complainest when I send it. Nevertheless, I answer thy prayer considering thy set will and purpose, rather than the natural repugnances of thy nature. End quote. Mark well the words of thy will. It is a question of will and not of feeling. True piety, the piety that makes reparation, has nothing to do with feeling. This truth should be printed at the foot 
of every page of this book. David said that he had found his heart that he might speak to God. We can do better than find ours, seeing that we have the heart of the Son of God. St. Bonaventura's sole desire was to dwell therein. He pitied the blindness of those who do not know how to find entrance into Christ through his open wounds, especially that of his heart. We then will say, I will enter humbly but resolutely even to the altar of my God. This holy sanctuary of his heart, where Jesus continually renews his sacrifice, shall likewise be mine. There I will offer my humble share in his work of redemption. How can I do this? By striving to unite my sentiments with those of his adorable heart, in conformity with the spirit of the apostleship of prayer, which is one of many methods and ranks with the best. Two ardent desires continually flow from the heart of Jesus. First, he is consumed by an insatiable thirst to do the will of his heavenly Father. Secondly, he thirsts continually for the baptism of blood which is to save us from eternal death. Now this twofold desire extends in Jesus to all that constitutes Jesus. It is indisputable that in his personal humanity our blessed Lord can no longer humble himself or suffer, but we constitute his mystical body and he desires that each Christian should give himself wholly to the fulfilling of God's will. The Sacred Heart desires each one of us to offer those acts of reparation which have to be united to his own sacrifice. If Jesus can no longer humble himself in himself, he can do so in us, for we are one with him. This is why he asks for our share and our offerings. Alas, how few understand his appeal, how few accept! Nevertheless, all true devotion to the Sacred Heart goes as far as this. It even constitutes its very essence, and those who interpret it otherwise either diminish or distort it. In the Eucharist, Jesus is with us under the form of the host, i.e., victim, thus clearly expressing his ardent desires. Under the species of the sacrament, our Lord does not actually suffer from the indifference, irreverence, immortification, pride, revolt, and sacrilege of men. But when he trod this earth, he foresaw all these and suffered unspeakable tortures on account of these insults and outrages offered to the divine majesty and from man's horrible neglect of God's laws. He foresaw every single sinful act and atoned for each in detail. He asks us to console him now for all his sacred heart suffered in those hours of trial. He wills that, by our piety, we should make him some compensation, since he has chosen to perpetuate by the Holy Eucharist the sacrifice which he consummated upon the cross. How can we better satisfy his desire than by continuing his sacrifice as he himself does, i.e., by becoming victims in union with him? And since, in this sacrament of love, Jesus still mystically hungers unspeakably, and suffers an unquenchable thirst to accomplish the will of God and save souls, what can we do better than enter into the sentiments of the divine guest of our tabernacles? We shall emphasize this point further on, when explaining the nature of the love for the blessed sacrament which should animate a soul devoted to reparation. Let what we have said suffice for the present. When we rightly understand true devotion to the sacred heart, our Eucharistic life becomes the union of two hosts, or victims, in the union of one perfect oblation. And when we truly grasp the meaning of our Eucharistic life, that is, our union with Jesus as victim, our devotion to the Sacred Heart then becomes practically one sustained effort of self-renunciation in order to become a living appearance, under which Christ alone lives. We aim at becoming a living appearance that he may use as an instrument to continue the accomplishment of his divine work, a living appearance that is unceasingly sacrificed with him in the unity of the same sacrifice for the glory of the adorable Trinity and the salvation of souls. We have dwelt somewhat on the revelations of St. Margaret Mary and the devotion to the Sacred Heart because they bear on the subject of reparation. This holds good of the great apparitions of Our Lady in France, to mention only those in the 19th century. In all these, it seems as though their sole object was to remind men of the need for reparation. To Bernadette, 
Our Blessed Lady expressed her grief at the invasion and flooding of the world by sin, and as some compensation, she asked that men should pray and do penance. She told Bernadette to recite the rosary, and asked that a church should be built at Lourdes in which God would be glorified by the public homage of the ardent acclamations of countless pilgrims boldly vindicating their, li their living faith in an age characterized by blasphemy and forgetfulness of God. Above all, she insisted upon the necessity of doing penance, saying sorrowfully, Penance, penance, penance. When she appeared to the two children at La Salette, she urged them to pray and to do penance. She told them sorrowfully that God was about to chastise men severely unless they prayed and did penance. She mentioned blasphemy and the desecration of the Sabbath as the two sins that especially cried to heaven for vengeance. What are we to learn from all this? The need of souls devoted to reparation. God is saddened by men's sins. It will fare badly with us if there are not voluntary victims forthcoming to fling into the other scale of divine justice their sacrifices to God. Reparation in actual demand of today. The more sterile the land, the greater is the call for labor. Morning and night we pray, Thy kingdom come. And yet what is more self-evident than the fact that our wish is still unrealized? Who would dare assert that God's kingdom has come? Is it not only too manifest that God's kingdom has not come, and that we see no signs whatever of its advent? An author places on the lips of St. Joan of Arc some words which fittingly describe the sad state of things at the commencement of Charles the Sixth reign, words which can truthfully be said by us in our days. Our Father, who art in heaven, how far, far off is the hallowing of thy name, how far off the coming of thy kingdom. The world is worse than ever. If only we could see the Son of Justice rise. But, O oh God, forgive me for venturing to say it, thy kingdom seems to be going farther and farther away. Never has thy name been so blasphemed, nor thy will treated with such contempt. Never has man been so disobedient. We have not yet enough saints upon earth. Send us as many as we need, as many as are necessary to dishearten the enemy. Hyas Mens, in his admirable introduction to the life of St. Lidwine of Shidam, gives an outline of the state of the world when God chose Lidwine for himself. When skating one day, she was knocked down and broke her ribs. Gangrene set in, and for thirty-eight years she endured intolerable sufferings both in soul and body. She was chosen by God to keep Satan thus in check, and to hinder the daily increase of his kingdom. Has the world changed much since the time of St. Lidwine? In her days, men killed one another. Our age can vie with that of those of older barbarians. Nations were crumbling to dust in decrepitude and decadence. Men were willing bond slaves and paid sophists and false shepherds without a conscience. Have we not seen this also? Money to bribe traitors was plentiful in those times. Is it not always at hand? There are philosophers in abundance, now as then, ready to excuse the greatest atrocities. Love of pleasure reigns universally. In a few days, I shall be twenty-three, it is time to enjoy myself. This motto has been practically followed by whole generations. Sin displays itself with such disconcerting cynicism and abundance. One hardly knows where to stop when giving examples. Then behind all these open vices are the faults that are sheltered and hidden. Alas, we lack apostles. Twenty-seven centuries ago the prophet Amos uttered this strange prophecy under the sycamores of Bethel. Behold, the days will come, saith the Lord, and I will send a famine into the land, not a famine of bread, not a thirst of water, but of hearing the word of the Lord, and they shall move from sea to sea. They shall go about seeking the word of the Lord and shall not find it. It is the same now, although Christ has come, the nations sit in the shadow of death. A tribe in central Madagascar has been deprived of their pastor. He was needed elsewhere, for there was a dearth of priests. This is what the deserted flock wrote to his superior. A terrible misfortune has happened to us. 
We are like men who have been suddenly plunged into utter darkness through the extinguishing of their torch. The torch of the Catholic faith has shone upon us and made us supremely happy. Alas, how sad is our fate now. Help us, Father. Hear our cry of distress. We are like sheep without a shepherd, the sport of wolves. Send us back our priest. True devotedness to the cause that we espouse means a great deal. It entails the service of our mind and intelligence, and above all our heart. It means loving the cause we are eager to further so much, that we are prepared to sacrifice ourselves wholly together with our tastes, preferences, habits, and inclinations, and not merely a given portion of them. It means loving souls so ardently that we go in pursuit of them, without waiting for them to come to us, without looking for their love and gratitude in return but devoting ourselves solely for the love of God and of souls. Such self-devotedness is by no means easy, and this is why the world in desolation clamors for it. The source of divine grace is ever within reach, ready to gush forth in living streams and to cleanse men from sin, to purify conscience, give sight to the blind, heal the leper and the paralytic. But volunteers are needed, as at the pool of Bethsheda, to bring God's help to succor the misery of humanity. The world contains two classes of people, the few who have eyes to see and intelligence to know what is passing around them and who are so affected by the sight that they are forced to give their assistance, and the others who see and understand nothing, or if by chance they obtain some inkling of the truth, take no heed. In the midst of a world that is hurrying on to destruction, they think only of feasting at the restaurants of their times. In any case, they give no thought to the millions of unhappy beings around them, creatures who are enslaved by wretchedness, doubts, and want of God. As we are so accustomed to live in the midst of egoism which prevails and rules everywhere, we do not perceive the hatefulness of this vice. Those whom some special grace has enlightened in their darkness of unbelief outside the church and lead them suddenly to the clairvoyance of faith in the gospel, are full of astonishment and contempt for the nobodies who fill the world and want nothing beyond the vanities which satisfy their mean desires. Consider two examples of a worldly life. A young girl lay on her deathbed, and just as she was expiring, she said to the nun who was nursing her, Sister, my hands are empty. An Austrian nobleman, as he lay dying, said, when God asks me to render an account of my life, what shall I answer? I can only say, Lord, I have killed hares, and hares, and hares, and nothing more. It is really too insignificant. And he spoke the truth. We are no partisans of Jansenism, no enemy of lawful amusements, but we condemn the terrible habit of looking at life from the sole point of view of how much pleasure it can be made to yield. There is something else to do. But we have not yet touched bottom. Men might at least be contented with neglecting God, as is the case with the majority, but some go further. For them, it does not suffice to ignore God. They are animated by a most virulent hatred of their Creator and of the Catholic Church. René Bazin, writing during the war with his usual delicacy of expression, sets forth the anomaly of a crucifix, which for years had occupied a place of honor in the schoolroom, being found by some American soldiers in the schoolmistress's attic. The crucifix had been relegated to the rubbish heap. Surely such an act of vandalism helps to explain how a conversation such as the subjoined could take place. Two children were in the museum at Cluny, looking at a large crucifix. Look, Madeline, said one, does not that man look wretched? Why does he hang down his head? He seems to be crying, don't you think so? Yes, poor little ones, indeed he weeps. He weeps because you do not know him. He sheds his tears because some of your family have prevented your knowing and loving him. Vile, degraded men who insult God and deny his very existence, who leave him on one side, are powerless to injure the Most High. Those who deny and insult must remain here below, Heaven is inaccessible to them. Earth, alas, is not, and we are sure that these insults rising from our midst will not fall back in punishments upon us. God is God. 
all those who put out the stars and deny the supernatural are powerless. They cannot get rid of him. God exists eternally. He, too, has his rights. God will not suffer man to treat him as an outcast with impunity, as one who can be overlooked or got rid of, as one who can be disposed of by an eloquent discourse, a vote, or a stroke of the pen. But if we cannot find enough volunteers to counterbalance all these insults, what may we not expect? In the time of Abraham, two cities would have been spared if only ten just men had been found, and how greatly we need just men! How many more of them? Father Matteo Crowley, the well-known Peruvian missionary who has traveled all over France, has truly said, For every social evil, I have found not simply one work of reparation, but a whole series of them. If these good works are to flourish, we must have many, many souls of good will, souls eager to adopt a mode of life like that so aptly set forth in the subjoined passage. We must give up certain satisfactions and practice mortification because others are suffering, and do these things with the greatest sympathy, because we feel drawn to share their sufferings. We must deprive ourselves likewise of certain pleasures, because others indulge in them to excess. In this case, we wish to ransom or compensate for their immoderation. So far as our position and powers allow, we try to maintain a certain level in the life of men. Send us, O Lord, we beseech thee, many of the just, to make compensation for their brethren. Make it please thee to send us not merely faithful souls of the rank and file, but generous souls, pledged to pay by their loyalty the ransom which thy justice has asked for so long. Suffering alone will not suffice. We need suffering welcomed, loving, and penitent suffering. There are other urgent needs, but these are the most imperative. But do yet more, dear Lord. Raise up souls who, not content merely to accept suffering, seek and desire it as a means of restraining the power of evil. These are the souls who make reparation to the uttermost. Cardinal Manning wrote, We do not live in the age of martyrs, but who knows, but in an age when each must have the will of a martyr. In a book written before the war, Daniel, the hero of the story, makes an excellent retort, which is likewise a rebuke to a worldly young priest who was quoting with satisfaction the words of a bishop in China who had witnessed many martyrdoms and speaking of them said, In my young days I long for martyrdom, but I do not want it now. Daniel replied, Let me tell you that if there are in France a thousand Christians, a hundred, or even twenty ready to suffer in their bodies the stigmata of the passion, these alone are the true disciples of Christ, and you may recognize them by their readiness to shed their blood joyfully. The earth on which we stand has drunk in their blood greedily. It was the blood of Sanctinius, of Bladena, and of Uranus. If France is to be born again, our blood too must be poured out. Yes, our blood too must be poured out. Not perhaps on the battlefield or in the arena, but it must be shed drop by drop in our daily striving after holiness, and for the restoration of humanity in Christ. It must be given drop by drop by the daily sacrifices, often so trivial and yet so meritorious of an existence spent wholly for God. The most faithful of these zealous souls give all to God, making the complete sacrifice of their self-love with all of its manifold reservations, of their most cherished attachments, of their most legitimate pleasures and joys. They give all for the joy of seeing God at last known, loved, and served as he merits. Christians and Reparation The obligation of perfecting or filling up the mission of Christ, and consequently his passion, falls more especially upon those who are called by God to consecrate their lives to him. But we cannot draw the conclusion that the ordinary Christian has no part in this noble work. On the contrary, each of the faithful both can and ought to assist and, in the measure of his generosity, enter the ranks of those consecrated to reparation. The first reason for this, and one which should appeal to even tepid Christians, is their own personal interest. We all know the laws of divine justice. We know that as surely as God exists and cannot cease to exist, so surely crime will not ultimately triumph, 
but sooner or later, sin will meet with its due punishment. God punishes sin sometimes upon this earth, but not often. He mercifully delays avenging sin in this world. After all, if a man persists in his evil doing, God can satisfy his justice in eternity. But peoples and nations, as such, have but a terrestrial existence, and consequently must pay the penalty of their evil deeds in this world. Their punishment here, in some form or another, is inevitable. This truth is strikingly exemplified in the history of the Old Covenant. Listen to the words of God addressed to the perverse Hebrews by the prophet Jeremiah. The Lord said to me, Behold, I will call together all the families of the north, and they shall come, and shall set every one his throne in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem, and upon all the walls round about, and upon all the cities of Judah. And I will pronounce my judgment against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me, and have adored the work of their own hands. Farther we read, Behold, I will bring upon you a nation from afar, a strong nation, whose language you shall not know, nor understand what they say. Their quiver is as open as a sepulchre, they are all valiant, and they shall eat up thy corn and thy bread, they shall devour thy sons and thy daughters, they shall eat up thy flocks and thy herds, they shall eat thy vineyards and thy figs, with the sword they shall destroy thy strong cities, wherein thou trustest. Note that God often makes use of a wicked nation as we learn from the history of the Israelites to give a salutary admonition or fulfill a glorious mission. Nor need we confine ourselves to past history. The present age provides us with striking parallels. Undoubtedly, we cannot apply this law to any one particular case. We cannot assert as a positive fact that Napoleon's exile and death in St. Helena was the expiation of his deeds because the general law is one thing and its particular application another, and this general law is as follows. All crime must be avenged, and God necessarily must triumph ultimately. It is possible, looking at the great war from one point of view, to assert without committing ourselves to any paradox that it was an act of mercy on God's part. On the other hand, it better fits in with the facts to look upon it as a punishment from God, as an act of divine justice. But men, blinded by pride, refuse to admit this explanation. A soldier wrote as follows, On all sides, agricultural implements, pierced with bullets, lie rusting on the ground. Tombs with their crosses are seen everywhere, in the middle of farmyards, in the clumps of brushes, under trees. Tell me, is it not terrible to look upon this vengeance of the cross? When shall we understand it? All who have gazed upon the innumerable cemeteries and thousands of tombs on the battlefields have felt this truth come home to them. Men had banished the cross from their public monuments, their courts of justice, their schools and highways, yet behold, the simple wooden cross is seen on all sides in the woods, along our highways, even in the midst of our gardens. What were men so eagerly seeking formerly? What, alas, are they still too often seeking? Pleasure and enjoyment. Even in so many so-called Christian families, what license is tolerated? What contempt is there of the most stringent laws of God touching the sanctity of wedlock? The observance of the Sabbath and due respect for the good of our neighbors. All modern life is planned out with the view of escaping from suffering and from the inconvenience of complying with the binding precepts of God and the Church. Meanwhile, suffering bides its time. It prepares its revenge. What remains of so many human joys? Happy homes and fair fortunes built up with such labor and trouble. Can we remain untouched by the sad vistas that open out and the inevitable sorrows that are foreshadowed? Can we be doing nothing to remedy this? Yes, we can do a great deal. St. Joan of Arc's words express a constant truth. The hands that grasp the pike gain fewer battles than the hands lifted up in prayer. Agitation prevails everywhere. Even more than in the past, the world has need of souls who are ready to ward off God's anger. 
uneasiness and wild rumors predominate, convulsions rumble in the distance. Would that we knew to what an extent we have in our power to bring the divine action into the sphere of our human history. For this, it is not necessary to give up natural means. We have to use them. But we must teach Christians, even those who have little faith in supernatural helps, that these play their part in modifying the course of human events. He is powerful who acts upon the first cause of all that is. Now the first cause of all in this world's history cannot be nothing. When St. Louis was setting forth on a crusade, a violent storm arose. The saintly king knelt for some time in prayer, then rising calmly, he assured his companions that the boat would make the voyage in safety. How do you know that? they asked. Because, replied the king, my monks of Clairvaux are praying and doing penance, so all will be well with us. A few years ago, someone asked one of the bishops of China which was the best means of obtaining the conversion of that immense empire. We must have some more Carmelites and some Trappists, replied the bishop. Such means might seem totally inadequate for the required purpose, but we cannot go against the truth. What then is the truth? Well, think what ruins souls, sin. What saves nations, holiness. And the two essential elements of holiness are prayer and penance. From this follow two conclusions. First, we have to ask ourselves whether in our own lives in any degree, however small, we have ever contributed to bring about the state of things which we deplore so much. In certain eastern countries, when a man has been murdered, the corpse is placed in some public place, and each citizen has to come forward in turn, and placing his hand upon the dead body, swear that he is innocent of the crime. In presence of our country in such dire distress, we must not imitate Pilate and declare, as he did when judging our Lord, that we are in no way to blame for these evils. Can we say how far the effect of our sins may have reached? Had there been not more just men in Sodom and Gomorrah, these two cities would have not perished by fire. Let us keep from sin. What overturns nations? Sin. It is the sins of individuals which draw down misfortune upon peoples far oftener than we imagine. Great calamities can come from a single mortal sin. One single mortal sin in itself is sufficient to cause God to send some great calamity upon the earth. Very few understand this, and yet it must be said. For what is a mortal sin? It consists in deliberately putting a creature in place of God, and ignoring him, and desiring to do away with him with such a thing possible. Now of itself the annihilation of all that is finite could never make adequate reparation for an insult offered to the infinite being. These are the exact data of the problem, and whatever decisions men promulgate or accusations of cruelty they bring against God, the problem remains as before. How many useful lessons we might learn even in our generation from the history of the chosen people of God, if indeed the men of our age could still take any interest in the subject. Take the subjoined example. When the army of Israel marched upon Jericho, one of the soldiers was guilty of a great fault. God has said all the booty was to be reserved for the treasury of the Lord, i.e., for sacred purposes. Disobeying this command, Achan, an Israelite, took from the spoils a scarlet garment, exceedingly good, two hundred sides of silver and a golden rule of fifty sides, and hid them in the ground. The army of Israel was defeated. Someone had disobeyed the Lord. The Lord of hosts left Israel to himself. The transgressor had to confess his sin and expiate it. Then, said the Lord to the Israelites, ye have won the day. Not ye shall win, but now ye have won the day. And in fact the Israelites then and there destroyed their foes. Thank God, however, that under the new law he does not often punish the masses for the crimes of individual persons. But nevertheless, God can do so if he wills, and in doing so he acts with perfect justice, since all the temporal punishments collectively cannot compensate for one mortal sin, seeing that there cannot be an approximation between the finite and the infinite. 
yet God in his mercy permits that sufferings inflicted upon him or voluntarily self-imposed by Christians shall have the power of expiating faults. Our Lord said to St. Margaret Mary, One just soul can obtain the pardon of a thousand sinners. In this way, without infringing on the rights of justice, God is able to exercise his mercy superabundantly. He frequently asks us to cooperate with him to our utmost so as to provide opportunities for him to show his infinite mercy. Our duty, then, is clearly marked out. We must not be scandalized, perhaps to the point of blasphemy, by occurrences that upset or distress us, as if we were amongst the pagans of today. We must not imitate the pharisaically faultless and self-righteous critics around us, who reject every explanation of historical events that accepts the principle of expiation. On the contrary, we must realize what sin really means, and in the future, avoid it as the greatest evil, whether for individuals or nations. It does not, of course, follow that given two nations, the most prosperous is necessarily the most holy. But the truth remains that theoretically, if not always, practically a mortal sin can bring the greatest calamity upon the world, and if we have any care for the well-being of society, our first duty is to lead a good life and avoid those deeds which God in his justice cannot do otherwise than punish. We should do well to meditate on what Newman writes on this question in the light of what we have just said. There is no fear of our mistaking his meaning. Quote, Let us not conclude that God makes use of other punishments today than of old, because we do not see his direct action. The principal difference between the punishments inflicted by God upon the Israelites and on Christians is that the former were visible, the latter invisible, that is. We do not perceive these evils today as the chastisements of God, because God himself or his chosen prophets no longer tell us of this explicitly. But the effects of God's angers are no less real, and even more terrible, seeing that they are proportioned to the greatness of the privileges which we have abused. End quote. The task set before all Christians is not, however, purely negative. Each one who desires to remedy to or prevent sin must place some counterpoise in the scale of God's justice. Alas, how many sins are committed in our land? For these, we must offer an ample measure of fidelity to prayer, acceptation of suffering and progress in holiness. Hence, every Christian should make reparation from a motive of self-interest. If he evades this obligation, the whole Christian body, all civilized society, an entire nation, may have to expiate his want of foresight or sinful indifference. Reparation for the sake of love but there is another and a nobler motive, not that of interest, but love. Is it possible to see God so insulted without feeling impelled to make him some compensation? Can we look on and see Christ our Lord, our head, mocked at and treated as an outlaw without a feeling of indignation, of regret, or of deeper love for his cause? Is it true that, from the days of his agony in Gethsemane and his crucifixion, he is accustomed to have but few of his disciples with him, but even so, can we be of that number? Where is the faith? Where are the noble sentiments that should animate the souls of baptized Catholics? Will none come forward to mitigate his sufferings? Will none try to comfort the church in her grief? Are there only priests and religious who can realize what suffering costs and how much misery afflicts men? Look around you and tell me whether the world is governed by the Spirit of God who created it or by the Spirit of Satan, the world's idol and destroyer. We must make reparation for all those who, though baptized by water in the Holy Ghost, have nevertheless sinned against him, yet we remain all the time indolent and inactive. Cardinal Manning The Holy Spirit is betrayed every hour of the day. Are there none willing to make reparation? We see the Church of Christ continually attacked, now openly and shamelessly, now secretly and cunningly. Are we always going to remain inactive? If we can remain so indifferent, it is because we do not love our mother the Church. 
The term mother is an empty sound, a mere mockery. Shall we suffer our mother to be insulted with impunity? Formerly, if any one had grieved our human mother, should we have not striven to make amends to her by increased tenderness? Monsignor Holst writes, We need in the world devout souls who love God and are desirous of making reparation and of doing it without stirring up the resentment or curiosity of their neighbors by their choice of means. Thanks be to God there are some, more perhaps than we think. It is related that a poor peasant woman was nursing her dying son. Presently, the young man, half opening his eyes, exclaimed, Mother, save me some water. I am dying of thirst. At this moment the clock struck three. The Christian mother took a crucifix and, placing it in her son's hand in a voice broken by tears, said to him, My dearest child, it is the hour when Jesus too was tormented by thirst and died for you upon the cross. Won't you endure a little thirst to be like him? Yes, mother, replied the young man, and putting the crucifix to his lips, he kissed it tenderly. Unconsciously, these two, mother and son, were animated with the sentiments of St. Francis of Assisi when he exclaimed, What, thou my Savior, art nailed to the cross and I am not nailed to it? Their generosity put these two among those good Christians of whom the saintly cure of ours once said, Worldly complains dolefully of having crosses. Good Christians grieve when they have none. True love ever begets imitation. This is the unequivocal mark of its genuineness. The cure of ours also used to say, A Christian lives amidst crosses like a fish in the water. It is indeed admirable what God can effect with such a wretched thing as the heart of a man. Let us admire it and, at the same time, try to understand it. Many know nothing of such heroic acts. Those who perform them, generally speaking, do not realize their own heroism. There are different degrees of generosity and greatness in these deeds, ranging from the most glorious to the most humble, which are not always the least meritorious. Those who have heard of these voluntary victims know that there are more than we can imagine. Doubtless, specially privileged souls retain their high place and are consequently not numerous, but God has chosen souls even in the world and among those who live an active life. It devolves upon us to cherish and guard those chosen grains of the purest wheat. If God has inspired us with the germ of generous desires, let us beware of the indifference that surrounds us. If we could be ready to suffer, we must love God. Is this so difficult? During the French Revolution, one of the judges of a revolutionary tribunal asked a saintly young girl, Marguerite de Pons, What are your religious views? To which she answered simply, I love God with all of my heart. And who cannot make the same reply? Loving God with all our heart, that is equipment enough for starting on the work of reparation. That, too, is enough to keep us carrying it on successfully until the end. A Solemn Act of Reparation to the Sacred Heart of Jesus Sacred Heart of Jesus, animated with a desire to repair the outrages unceasingly offered to thee, we prostrate before your throne of mercy, and in the name of all mankind, pledge our love and fidelity to thee. The more your mysteries are blasphemed, the more firmly we shall believe them, O Sacred Heart of Jesus. The more impiety endeavors to extinguish our hopes of immortality, the more we shall trust in your heart, sole hope of mankind. The more hearts resist your divine attractions, the more we shall love thee, O infinitely amiable heart of Jesus. The more unbelief attacks your divinity, the more humbly and profoundly we shall adore it, O divine heart of Jesus. The more your holy laws are transgressed and ignored, the more we shall delight to observe them, O most holy heart of Jesus. The more your sacraments are despised and abandoned, the more frequently we shall receive them with love and reverence, O most liberal heart of Jesus. The more the imitation of your virtues is neglected and forgotten, the more we shall endeavor to practice them, O heart, model of every virtue. 
the more the devil labors to destroy souls, the more we shall be inflamed with desire to save them, O heart of Jesus, zealous lover of souls. The more sin and impurity destroy the image of God and man, the more we shall try by purity of life to be a living temple of the Holy Spirit, O heart of Jesus. The more your holy church is despised, the more we shall endeavor to be her faithful children, O sweet heart of Jesus. The more your vicar on earth is persecuted, the more we will honor him as the infallible head of your whole church. Show our fidelity and pray for him, O kingly heart of Jesus. O sacred heart, through your powerful grace, may we become your apostles in the midst of a corrupted world, and be your crown in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.